Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, it is seven o'clock and we'll be starting here in just a few seconds. We usually have a few stragglers that come in um, right when we're starting. So we'll wait a few minutes, but um, I do want to go ahead and welcome you all uh, for being here tonight. We, um, we are pleased with the, um, with the way this uh, Stay at home lecture series has uh, has progressed and ha and how successful it's been. It's been a really a nice treat to see how many people have uh, enjoyed these presentations and and getting good feedback and getting suggestions for more presentations. So we appreciate that. The society appreciates that. Thank you all for being here. As I mentioned, the stay at home lecture series as you probably know by now, is sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and the Health Professions, which is um, a support organization for the, his the UAMS Historical Research Center. The Historical Research Center is the archives unit of UAMS. We collect the institutional history of the campus and the medical school and the medical center. And we also collect materials that document the health sciences throughout Arkansas. So we have materials that may deal with a doctor up in Northwest Arkansas that might not have a connection uh, to UAMS at all. In addition uh, to, of course, we're, we're far more than the doctors. Uh, we we document, more, document more than doctors. We document the entire aspect of the health sciences in Arkansas. That, so every health profession, we try to get materials on um, to preserve that. Uh, that history. We are the only archives in the state whose main collecting priority is the collection and preservation of uh, health sciences in Arkansas. We were established in 1978 and are home to uh, all types of archival materials, photographs, letters, journals, rare books, um, and then also artifacts. We have a great collection of artifacts and at some point, whenever we're open to the public again, I'd love for you to come down and um, get a tour of the Historical Research Center. And also, if you if you have any materials that document any aspect of the historical research or any aspect of the health sciences in Arkansas, we'd love to preserve those materials. So uh, please get in touch with me. Um, my email is tgnutt, N-U-T-T, at uams.edu. And especially during these pandemic times, we're really interested in collecting materials um, about how people weathered the pandemic, how they spent their time. So photographs, uh, journal, diary entries, newspaper clippings, anything like that that document the COVID-19 pandemic we're really interested in. Um, as usual, I forgot to advance my slide but there's the information for the Historical Research Center on your screen, hrc at uams.edu, if you'd like to get in touch with us is our email address. Now, as I've mentioned before, uh, these this lecture series is sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and the Health Professions, and it is the friends group for the Historical Research Center. If you're not a member of the of the society. I hope you will consider joining. The dues are relative, are inexpensive, $5 for student. You don't have to be a student at UAMS. You can be a student at Fayetteville or at Arkansas State and Jonesboro or anywhere in the state. And it doesn't even have to be in the state. It can be out of state as well. Uh, and then $15 for an individual uh, membership. So I hope you'll consider joining if you're not a member. And if you are a member, you should have gotten an email today about renewing your membership. The um, the link on your screen that you see on the screen, that will take you to um, the society's webpage where you can um, print out a form uh, to renew your membership or join, but you can also go directly to paypal.me uh, slash shmhp where you can just pay online. A couple of things uh, tonight, as you probably, if you've attended these before, you probably know your video is, uh, uh, stopped and your audio is muted. So um, that's just so there's not a distraction to the speaker. And as usual, you can, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature 
uh, type your questions in the chat. You don't have to wait until the very end to do that. If you have a question come up during uh, the presentation, just feel free to type it in the chat. We probably won't get to it until the end of the presentation, but uh, you certainly don't have to wait uh, to do that. Now, these, pre these uh, lectures, they do happen at the first Thursday of every month from seven to eight. Next month's le lecture is on March 4th. I'll be the presenter and I will be talking about female healthcare, healthcare leaders in early 20th century Arkansas. So I hope you'll be able to join uh, me for that one and then all future uh, stay at home lecture series. The link that you used to join tonight will be the same link that you use next time and any other lectures after that. Um, so feel free to write that down, bookmark it. You won't have any trouble. Now, before we move on for tonight's um, presentation, I do want to bring up or, or alert you to something that is upcoming next week on February 11th, a week from tonight. Uh, the Society, in conjunction with the uh, College of Public Health at UAMS and the Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care here in Little Rock, will be presenting a documentary entitled An Oral History of the Faye W. Bozeman College of Public Health. Um, that was a, a, um, a documentary funded by the College of Public Health and produced by the Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care. We will be airing it on, our, on the Society's Facebook page. So uh, if you have Facebook, you can go to the Society's page there and watch it on there. If you don't have access to Facebook or you don't have an account, get in touch with me and my email is on the screen there and we'll figure out a way where you can participate in the documentary airing next week. And tonight I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Sam Taggart. And Dr. Taggart has given a couple of these presentations before. This is the third in the series on his Country Doctors of Arkansas. Tonight it's the impact of changing technology. Dr. Taggart is a retired family physician. He practiced in Benton. And he's also been a member of the society board for a number of years. The research he gathered uh, uh, that are presented in these presentations are actually will actually appear in a book that um, summarized his research finding in, in the oral history interviews that he did uh, on Country Doctors of Arkansas. So I am going to um, turn on his audio and video. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, we're having trouble getting him. There he, there he comes. I think he's. I just hit it myself. Okay. Okay. Start my video. Yeah, start your video. Okay, you there, you, there you are. I am going to turn off my video. I'm going to leave and then I'm going to unmute my audio as well. I'm going to turn it over to you and you just tell me when to advance to the next slide. Okay. okay? All right. Good evening, friends. Uh, my name is Sam Taylor. Uh, I am really excited about this talk. And I told Tim, I've given talks since I was in my 20s and I'm a little nervous about this talk and I don't really know why. Obviously, I'm talking about country doctors. Uh, most country doctors in Arkansas began their lives in small towns and made the conscious decision to return to those small towns. When literature is written about country doctors, it's most often done with an admiring eye and for good reasons. Several characteristics in common with most of these men and women. They generally have a quiet voice, a warm smile, and a soft touch. They're trusted by their communities. They're trusted to be there when they are needed. They're trusted to do the right thing. Most often they're thought of as wise, uh, as a father confessor or a narrator of life for the community. But part of their job is to be a priest of technology. How do new technologies fit into the into the lives of them, of, into their lives, and to the lives of their patients. Uh, first slide, next slide. 
At the beginning of the 19th century, the doctor was practicing medicine was on horseback. Okay. The doctor, most often it was a young doctor, would get up each morning and he would pack two different sets of saddlebags. One set of saddlebags he had his equipment in, and it was a meager, it was a meager amount of equipment, bandages, uh, bone rongeurs, <laughs> and a tooth key, tooth key. These men were, not only were they physicians, men, and these were all men, not only were they, not only were they physicians, they were dentists, they were pharmacists, and they were veterinarians. The other set of bags that he had were called pill bags. And you can see these on this slide. These are pill bags. And in these pill bags, they had biologic simples, what we today call herbal preparations, and uh, a number of different other things that he would, they would compound with those herbal simples. One of the most important was blue mass or mercury. And it made, these men were called pill rollers because they would roll their own pill. Ultimately, they got a little more sophisticated and added a gelatin so that so people could swallow their pills. There was very little technology that came to bear on the country doctors of Arkansas, the country doctors of anywhere during that first half of the 19th century. Next slide. At the, at the, about the time of the Civil War, the life expectancy was about 39.5 years on average, if you take all everything together, okay? And there were several major things that happened at or around the time of the Civil War. Up until that time, the idea of an epidemic constitution, that was that a certain, uh, that there had to be a set of circumstances uh, present for illness to manifest itself for cholera to manifest itself, for the fevers to manifest themselves. And it was about this time, maybe a little bit before, that the germ theory, that uh, Pasteur and Jenner, and these people began to put forward the germ theory. Now, the germ theory turned everything that these people did on its head. It turned it completely around, okay? It was a new technology, a really new technology, a really new idea for the average practicing physician. One of the things we're going to think about tonight that I want you to think about tonight is that with any new technology that ever happens in medicine, there is an inflammation, inflammation float time. That's the amount of time it takes for something to be discovered, validated, disseminated, and incorporated. And in the mid 19th century, mid to late 19th century, the information flow time was also often in terms of the lifespan of a physician. So a guy would be trained uh, in, one, in one thing and he would do that until he died. So that the germ theory only slowly began to make its way into uh, what physicians did and didn't do. Uh, but this was a major, major sea change for these folks. Uh, new, next slide. There were a number of technologies that had been coming about and developing in the early part of the 19th century. And then, cat. In the early part of the 19th century. Okay, one of those was the stethoscope. And if you look in the left upper hand corner of the of this slide, that is the, one of the original stethoscopes that was developed in about uh, 1816, 1817. It was Rene Lenec. And at that time, to listen to someone's chest, you simply put your ear on their chest. And the story, and it may be apocryphal, the story is that, that Dr. Lenek was somewhat embarrassed to listen to young women's chest by putting his ear on their chest. So he invented the stethoscope. And it went through many, many modifications. We do know that as late as 1860, uh, Harvard Medical School, the stethoscope was not part of the armamentarium that their graduates left out from. But we do know also that during the Civil War, people began to use stethoscopes. 
and, and, and they became commonplace by the 1860s, 18, late, early 1870s and the 1880s. The thermometer in the upper right, right-hand corner had been an idea that people had looked at and tried to work with for years and years, but it was, these were a, a, a foot and a half instruments. They were not portable. They could not be used. Uh, they could not be used on a regular basis. But in about 18, about 1861, 62, uh, a fellow developed a portable six inch oral thermometer. And this very quickly became part and parcel of what the physicians used. Prior to this, they simply looked, they put the hand on the forehead, they listened to the patient, uh, but now they had a way of measuring, accurately measuring what the temperature was going to be. In the lower left-hand corner of the slide, you'll see the hypodermic syringe and hollow needle. Okay, these were inventions that had been kind of working their way through the process in the early part of the 19th century. As best I can tell, the, the needle and syringe made its first introduction into Arkansas in a, by a Dr. Kimmery in Akron, Arkansas. And that's on the eastern bank of the White River, just north of Jacksonport and Newport. Now, the second reference I can find to someone using a syringe and needle was a doctor, uh, Thomas Ackerman of Ryzen, Arkansas. He came to Ryzen, Arkansas in the mid 1870s from Vanderbilt and he brought this new technology to Southwest Arkansas. For those physicians in the room, you will recognize this last name and yes, it is the same family. This is the great grandfather, excuse me, this is the grandfather of Dr. George Ackerman who taught many of us in medical school in the last half of the 20th century. The sphygmomanometer, the blood pressure cuff, there had been interest in, in checking people's blood pressure uh, uh, for a couple, for several centuries, but the portable or at least semi-portable blood pressure cuff uh, did not really start to be used until the 1880s, 1890s in Arkansas. The otoscope and the ophthalmoscope, these are two instruments that we think of as un, as totally, we can't do without them, okay? But they did not show up until the late part of the 19th century, and in some places until the early part of the 20th century. Just prior to the Civil War, nitrous oxide, ether, and chloroform had been discovered to be good anesthetic agents. And uh, they, made their, they made their way after the Civil War, during the Civil War they were used, and after the Civil War they made their way into, in the, into the bags of country doctors. And this is about the time that kitchen table surgery became a reality. But prior to that, prior to the early 19th century, elective surgery simply wasn't done. And when surgery was done, it was who could get in the fastest, the quickest, and get out the fastest. That was the whole point. It was after this that antisepsis, stopping infection, anesthesia, the nitrous and, and chloroform, hemostasis, not, over, not letting the patient bleed too much, and gentleness with tissue became the became the guideposts that are used in surgery to, even to this day. Uh, uh, next slide. The, the, the microscope had been about, had been around since the 1700s. Leeuwenhoek present, uh, developed a, a crude microscope, but it wasn't until they, until the, the, the physicians had a need to identify the bacteria that were causing various illnesses, as with the germ theory, tuberculosis, uh, uh, staph infections, pneumococcal infections, uh, that the microscope became a real instrument and it began to be used. Initially, it separated the country doctors from the city doctors, but, it, but very quickly, the city, the country doctors adopted this technology too. Now, it had limited use until they had a reliable light source, like an electric light, which they did not have in the late 19th century in Arkansas. They had candlelight, but they didn't have a lot 
They didn't have a lot else. Uh, gram staining and acid fast staining. And I know you're out there, Dr. Bates. Gra gra gram staining and acid fast staining came along, along at about this same time to help clearly identify the, the particular bacteria that they found on the slide of the sputum or whatever, whatever other uh, uh, exudate that they found or discharge that they found from a wound. The other area that was really very important, understand that, that the idea of urinalysis has been around since before the time of Christ. People looked at the urine, they looked at it for clarity, they looked at it for turbidity, they looked at it for specific gravity, they looked at it for taste, they looked at it for smell. But finally, they had an instrument that they could begin to look at what was in the urine. They could begin to look at casts. And if you'll see in this, uh, this slide in the middle, these are cast, cellular casts that they found in the urine. Um, they were able to culture the urine. They were able to clearly identify crystals in people's urine who they thought might have gout or pseudogout or something like that. Next slide, please. The one, a, a non, essentially a non-medical technology that came along in the late 19th century, the last two decades of the 19th century, and in the early beginnings of the 20th century was electricity. And this changed everything. It changed the lives of the doctor. It changed the lives of the people in the community. And it changed the way they practiced medicine. Now, electrical sources in the late 19th century were not reliable. And in Arkansas, you really didn't have reliable electricity until probably the 1930s in most areas. There were municipal electric companies that popped up as late as the 1890s and through the first two decades of the year. But most of those, many of those failed. They were unreliable. And in fact, there is one report that uh, the entire town of Russellville uh, boycotted their electric company because it was so unreliable and didn't wasn't very much help. Okay, but these this really did change things. Next slide, please. The there were three these there were three technologies that changed the place where medicine was practiced. One was the X-ray unit. The uh, X-ray was, was, was discovered and, and, and actually they'd been working on it for a while, but really Rankin did, did it in, in 1895. Now, this is an example of where the, extra, uh, the, the information flow time was really, really fast. He discovered this in 1895. In 1896, a Dr. Gladden at the University of Arkansas, an engineering professor, the first engineering professor at the University of Arkansas Industrial School in Fayetteville, did the first x-ray in Arkansas of a hand of a patient who had a broken hand. That was one year after it was discovered. Within 10 years, there were x-ray units beginning to pop up in rural Arkansas. There was, there was an x-ray unit uh, in Batesville, a Dr. Lawrence in Batesville, and probably, don't, I, I don't know this for absolute sure, but Dr. Edward McGee in Lake Village probably had an x-ray machine. You might ask, what did they use for a power source if they didn't have electricity? Well, they probably used what are known as conduction coils and dry cell batteries to build up the voltage so they could get the, so they could get the, uh, an adequate x-ray. Now, these weren't great x-rays, but they were adequate x-rays. An interesting point, just to show you how fast technology can, can, can move, within 10 years, okay, people were using barium, uh, barium swallows to help identify GI problems with x-ray. So these are really interesting, ra very rapid changes. In the center of this, in the center of this uh, field, you'll see sterilizers. They didn't need adequate electricity to do this, but sterilizers were large. So now we have, we have a um, microscope, we have an x-ray unit, and we have a sterilizer. These can't go on the back of a horse, okay? The, the, where medicine was practiced had cha changed 
almost instantaneously. Okay, let's look at the next slide. The, and what you begin to see in the very first part of the, of the uh, 20th century is doctors in small towns having offices. An office is more than a than a than an afterthought. Initially, offices were just an afterthought where you stored equipment, but then they began to have uh, they began to have small offices. The, up in the left hand corner, you'll see a rather uh, uh, rundown looking place. But apparently, this was a big deal back in those days. You saw increasing doctors' offices, and this is where doctors' hospitals began to develop in Arkansas. And doctors' hospitals, other than the tertiary care hospitals in Little Rock, Jonesboro, uh, a little bit in Texarkana and in Fayetteville, uh, doctors' hospitals uh, dominated the care. In the very center of this, of this middle slide, you'll see a, an, a, an old black and white film uh, of uh, the Smith Hospital in Paris, Arkansas. The Smith doctors, and there's still a Smith practicing. He's actually in Ozark instead of Paris now. But these men were very forward thinking men. Uh, their forward thinking got them in trouble a number of times, but they were very forward thinking men. They were some of the first people to offer an insurance plan to, to, the, to the coal workers in that, in that part of the Arkansas River Valley. If you look at the right hand corner, right lower hand corner of this, of this slide, you'll see the office of Dr. Dual Gann Sr. from Benton. Dr. Gann, and you, you, you know, many of you know, Hot uh, Sling County is known for its bauxite. Well, this building is made out of bauxite, and his patients built this building for him. Okay, next slide, please. The, when you started making the transition from horseback uh, to buggies, uh, to, and it didn't go straight to cars. It really didn't go straight to cars because if you'll see in the right hand side of this car, though there weren't many serviceable roads in Arkansas. And that was true, wasn't completely true. There was some, there was some were attempts, there were attempts to create serviceable roads in the 20s and 30s, but the flood of 1927 and the flood of 1937 washed away a lot of the progress that they made there. And it wasn't until after, uh, after uh, World, War, uh, World War II, uh, that the governor, the run for governor, I uh, can't remember his name right now, Sid McMath, okay? One of the play platforms of his, of his, of his uh, uh, running for governor was he would have a, he would have a hard, uh, all weather surface road in every county. At the time of the end of World War II, there were at least seven counties in Arkansas that did not have was not, were not connected in any way to other Arkansas counties in, on anything. Their, their roads would go right up to the county line and stop. The train was different, okay? There were train tracks all throughout the, all throughout Arkansas. There was a spider web of train tracks. And there are, there are a number of instances where doctors did not trust the roads, but they trusted getting on a train. Uh, T.E. Thornton, to, excuse me, T.E. Ryan of Thornton, uh, if he had a seriously ill patient that he couldn't take care of, he would get on a train and take that patient to Memphis. Uh, Dr. John William Morris from McCrory, uh, who by this time was in practice and, and was, was uh, and he said the same thing. He would get on a train and ride with the patient to the hospital in, in Memphis Hospital, Memphis City Hospital in Memphis and stay there until the patient was operated on. There is a there is a there's a cute story, and I, this is real. This is true. This is not an apocryphal story. A Dr. Craffin from Morrow, not Morrow Bay down in South Arkansas, but Morrow over in between the Arkansas, between the White and the Cache Rivers, bought a car in Memphis, uh, cross land, probably not more than forty miles, but he could not get the car to his home. They had to put the car on a steamboat take it down the river, down to where the White River went into the Mississippi, come back up river for him to get the car delivered. So the demand for serviceable roads was a really, really important thing for these people. And it made a, it made a whole lot of difference in how people practiced medicine. Okay, next, next slide, please. The first half 
of the of the 19th of the 20th century saw the first 40 years saw some really interesting changes okay smallpox immunization had been around forever people didn't like to take it but uh, Dr. Garrison with the with the health department mandated it and his board mandated it. And so smallpox immunization began in wholesale in the in the late 18, or excuse me, late 19, it was during the, during the World War I, uh, to, to uh, 17, 16, 17. Interesting point about this, by the way. They started this the first time, the first school that was required to do smallpox was Kensett. And one of the first graders in that school was Wilbur Mills. Uh, Wilbur Mills would be in 1937, would be the county judge for White County, Kinsett's in White County. And he created a Medicare-like program for the poor people during the depression of he enlisted the hospitals, he enlisted the doctor's offices, and he enlisted the pharmacists to give a break to these people who didn't have any money. Fast forward to 1956-57, he's the head of the House Rules uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, in, in Washington, and he's the one who crafted the, with the assistance of some, and, and an objection to some of the country doctors of Arkansas, but he's the one who helped craft what Medicare became in 1964. Heroin, morphine, and cocaine had been around forever, but there were a lots and lots of uh, lots of, of uh, non non -pres non prescription uses of it. And the the um, Harrison Act of 1914 made that so that you had to be very specific about what you were prescribing these medicines for. In 19 Oh, I forgot about the, uh, the pure food and, and drug uh, bill of 1906 was really important in helping uh, improve what was written on labels uh, by a doctor or by anybody who was prescribing them, whether it was a pharmacist or whatever it happened to be. In 1922, the first of the chronic, excuse me, of the illnesses that, that were so dreadful well, diabetes, pr primarily type one diabetes, was attacked by a Dr. Banting up in Canada. This is in 1922. With the help of E.J. Lilly, e. Lilly, they created a product of, of insulin that could be used to treat these poor little diabetic, mainly diabetic children. This is 1922, back to the information flow time. By 1925, three years later, insulin was the standard of care for diabetes. So it, when, when a technology came, around, came along that had these absolutely wonderful benefits and they could clearly identify it, it happened. And it happened pretty quickly. The 1930s, sulfa came on board, antibiotics, you all know the story about that. And in the 1940s, penicillin. Uh, penicillin was released for civilian use in 1946, and, and this may be apocryphal story, but it has been said over and over and over again, so it may be true, is that by 1950, that 75% of all visits to doctor's offices resulted in a shot of penicillin. And it made a dramatic, dramatic difference. That one little technology, that one technology made a dramatic change. Okay, next slide, please. The modern era of country doctors began or begins in 1946. It depends, it begins after the war was over, okay? Health insurance had been, had been promulgated, uh, first Blue Cross Blue Shield in, in 1929 in Texas. And then, uh, as I said, there were four or five different industry-based insurances in Arkansas. There were uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield in Arkansas started in 1947. There had been an attempt to create national health insurance, uh, both in the 1930s and in the 1940s. But both of those programs failed. And I should say that, that most of that was because of lobbying from negative lobbying because of the physicians. The one part of that that did stay and it became a really important element 
in the practice of medicine in Arkansas in the second half of the 20th century was the Hilburton Act. And up in the left-hand corner, you'll see a picture of the uh, Crittenden County Memorial Hospital. This was one of the first, this was the first Hilburton Hospital in Arkansas. Ultimately, there were numerous hospitals built, numerous nursing homes were built, and these hospitals provided, particularly in the country, provided the uh, provided the infrastructure for medicine. There was a study done in 1949 by Jerry Coddington out of Fayetteville. It was done according to by the health department when Jerry Coddington did it. That showed that many of the small hospitals run by doctors were not very. They were not doing a very good job, and they didn't have a very good. They didn't have a very good record. Another technology that had been slow in coming, but by the, by the end of the war or two, was, had, had a dramatic impact, and that was immunizations. Uh, immunizations began to be promulgated uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, and, but by the time of the end of World War II, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, DPT, was put together. Most of us who were born and raised in that we remember those shots. Okay, uh, uh, you could. In, in this was in the days before polio. Polio came along real soon after that. So you had DPT and polio, and you had typhoid. These were things that were very important, not just to the practice of medicine, but just to the overall health of the community. Health changed when that did. The life that plus improved, really improved another technology, improved water support supplies done by the health department of Arkansas and improved food, improved housing. The life expectancy had dramatically improved. By the end of World War II, the life expectancy was now up to 68 years. We'll get on to that in just a second, but I want to go with the, the center of this is CME, CMC, it's CME is what I'm talking about. Uh, Continued medical education, when you have all of these new technologies coming on board, continuing medica medical education was exquisite, exquisitely important. And there was really no format for doing that. The Arkansas, the, 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 the probably the most important areas that provided information were the county medical societies. The county medical societies and all these small counties would have meetings and somebody would be uh, would be designated to, to read up on it and give a presentation to everybody in the room. The Arkansas Medical Society did some continuing medical education as well. The Southern Medical Association was primarily developed as an association to help improve the education of those people of postgraduate education. I'm proud to say this, as you, as you know, I'm a retired family physician. Uh, the Arkansas Academy of General Practice started in 1947-48. One of the requirements for the national uh, for the national society and for the state society is that you had to get 150 hours of continuing education every three years. So the first society to require that as part of being a member. And now the question again, where do they get these in? Well, the medical center jumped into the jumped into the fray on this and began offering programs. This along with some people like Lee Parker from Dermot, who were really, really very important in helping improve the educational status of the people out in the state. Now, with this improvement in life expectancy, you began to see diseases that are thought that were thought of as the consequence of aging. They weren't treatable diseases. Heart disease, uh, next slide, please. They weren't thought of necessarily as independent diseases. They were thought of as these were just things that happened to you as you aged, as your body wore out. Heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, cancer, diabetes, all of these things were considered uh, simply diseases of aging. And what they had begun to, and th this technology had been coming forward for a couple of decades, they'd beginning to see, okay, is there a way you can detect these illnesses? Now that we're getting many of these childhood illnesses under control, is there a way we can deal with these 
illnesses of the age of the of the elderly, and that's exactly uh, what happened. There were study, there were a number of studies done. I think most of you are familiar with the Framingham study that was started in 1946, the Ansel Keys Seven Country Study, the Northern Korea Study. All these studies put together how to detect illness early, how to identify risk factors, and then how to do risk reduction. They didn't know if they could do that at that point. They didn't know, in fact, by the time, as late as the 70s, when I started practicing medicine, we didn't know if the risk reduction really did a lot until these good, really good studies started to show. Uh, uh, but they were really important. But this changed the face of medicine. This changed the face of what happened. In 1956, if you had a heart attack, uh, they, your doctor would put you to bed, give you morphine, and hope you didn't die. That's about it. There wasn't a whole lot else. There were some other medicines that they could treat your heart failure with. There were some, some crude medicines that they could treat your irregular heart rhythms with. But for the most part, it, 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 was, not, it was not a good sign. Next slide, please. Heart disease was one of those big ones, and we all think about this, we talk about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but except to say and that, that the, the turnaround and the changes in the last 50 years, that what it did to the technology that was available to the doctor, the country doctor in his office, and what he could do about it dramatically changed almost as much as the germ theory changed things. Uh, they, they identified risk factors. They began to see that cigarette smoking was dramatically involved in heart disease and stroke and all these other kinds of things. The EKG, which had been kind of used, but kind of not used, really became on board as an important tool uh, to be used. Stress testing uh, came along in, uh, I can remember when the University of Arkansas Medical Center did not have a treadmill to do stress testing. CCUs came along in the 60s and 70s, and these changed, and they, they started going out in the country. They started going into smaller and smaller hospitals so that you could have, so you could monitor your patients. But one of the important things that happened was ambulances. Prior to, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. I'll go, let's go forward. Let's, let's look at the next slide. Cancer prevention, uh, as you all know, uh, I couldn't, I can't cover all the cancers. But what I want to cover is the the practical changes, uh, the practical things of technology that changed really quickly. Okay, we all know that the chest X-ray, the chest X-ray had been the hallmark. What you do, what you look for, but oftentimes when um, a a chest, lung cancer was found on a chest x-ray, it was too late. And ultimately, CT scanning would change that. CT scans in small towns, not CT scans in Little Rock, okay? And then in the 60s and 70s, you began to get people checking the, the stool for blood. And this card, the card in the middle you see is a little blue card, and that means that there's blood in that stool. If that was done earlier in time, the only recourse that the physician had was a barium enema. And in, in 1969, 1970, the, uh, the, the, the flexible colonoscope, the flexible um, um, uh, EGD instrument came on board, but they, were, they required uh, uh, fiber optic material that you could see around corners, okay? And it really developed this, this technology and it penetrated out into small communities because if you're rare, fairly facile with your hands and you take some training, you could do this. This country doctors could use a colonoscope that could use an EGD scope without any difficulty. The blood, uh, breast cancer, uh, it, it was simply a matter of luck. These were not good diseases to have. And in the, in the 60s, uh, the technology came on board and quickly spread. This is another web time where the, where the technology spread extremely quickly, okay, they, uh, that mammograms started to be able to do. And in 1969, uh, Wilma Diner did a, presented a paper to the Arkansas Academy, to the, to the Arkansas Medical Society that said everybody ought to do, be doing mammograms. And for once, everybody paid attention. 
and very soon everybody was doing mammograms. Pap smears, yeah, really developed in the 1940s, a little bit before that, a little bit before, and in, in in Arkansas in the in the 19 in 1957, the Miller can't remember the name of the, the, the clinic. It was Miller Clinic, there's another name for it, in Texarkana, did a long study, a four or five year study, where they looked at was, were pap smears effective in helping to identify cancer of the cervix and could it stop cancer? Could they, could they save the lives of these women? It's Bowie Miller Clinic is what it was. Within, within five years, that became the standard of care in the country and the city and everywhere. Um, the PSA, PSA uh, it has some problems, but it, is one, it was one of the first tools to help identify, is this, is this prostate disease, is it significant or is it not significant? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the technologies of, of robotic surgery and those kinds of things because they're pretty well regimented to, Two large towns, but they do have an impact. Uh, I didn't. I didn't talk about uh, the advent of of um, angiograms and 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 coronary artery uh, uh, bypass and and the like, and the impact that it had. And it has a one. It's had a wonderful impact, <clears throat> but most of it was relegated to large cities. The country doctor had to get had to identify these people and get them to them. Uh, next slide, please. Stroke. Uh, again, again, stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. Uh, and the blood pressure cuff. It was real interesting. Uh, blood pressure readings, as late as the 1950s, we really didn't know what was high, what was low, how much is, how much is reasonable, and how much wiggle room do you have. And very slowly but surely, with more and more people taking their blood pressure, more and more, the, the blood pressure cuff moved from the doctor's office to the patient's home. And we'll talk about this later with telemedicine, but it moved to the patient's home. And when they began to getting, when people began to getting uh, more careful, close watching of the blood pressure, the stroke rate started to drop. And Dr. Bates is with us tonight. He's my mentor. Uh, and I could never say anything. I couldn't say anything. Stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. I mean, that was a big deal. Okay. Another technology that had a big impact on stroke <clears throat> was the development of ultrasound. And ultrasound came along at a time in late in the late 19 vascular ultrasound did in the late 1960s. Could you pick up something that was dangerous early? You detect it and then do some kind of risk reduction. Next slide, please. Chronic obstructive lung disease, smoking, 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 smoking. We're going to talk about that, okay? But the technology of doing pulmonary function studies, the technology of chest x-rays, the, 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 the getting people to quit smoking, dealing with uh, industrial disease like silicosis and bagasosis, that's cotton dust, uh, and silicosis, those things were extremely important and they had an impact on the people who were doing the cotton ginning work and the people who were working in rock quarries. Uh, um, and we didn't talk about, I'm not going to talk about black lung because we don't have a whole bunch of that here. We have probably, we may have had some of it, but not a whole bunch. Okay, next slide. Diabetes is, is an interesting, is an interesting phenomenon. I'm going to use this to talk about some technologies that changed and it were not necessarily just diabetes. Prior to, prior to the 19, uh, early 1950s, it was, it, you could get a blood sugar, but it was not real time blood sugars. Most blood sugar checking was, most urine monitoring, most was, most monitoring was done on urinalysis and urine dipsticks more than it was blood sugar checks. And in the late, in the 50s and in the 1960s, primarily with space technology and the engineering that went along with it, Auto, uh, auto, the auto analyzer. If you look at the le left or screen, you'll see an auto analyzer. These were, these were machines that could, they could do a lot of blood work real quick. And they started out in tertiary care hospitals. They went to primary care hospitals. Then they went from primary care hospitals to doctor's offices. And 
those machines and those facilities uh, had a had a big impact in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Eventually, most of those were replaced by large lab companies who could give a physician uh, one day service where they could do all their uh, where they could get their material back in one day. To to do the short term, you had finger stick blood sugars. Again, this started in large hospitals went to small hospitals, went to the doctor's office and ran out the door to the patient's office, to the patients. To, and this had a big impact on the tight control of diabetes for patients out in the country. Very, very important. And I, I put this slide on for the insulin pump because it's just, this is just another example of the changes in technology as they occurred. Okay, next slide, please. I want to spend just a just a second here on the fact that that uh, I mentioned that the, that we didn't have a lot of serviceable intrastate highways before 1947, and that changed in the 50s and 60s. Okay, the uh, in 19 in the 19 in the 1950s, if you needed an ambulance, it is usually a hearse like the one in the left lower hand quarter corner. Uh, they did most of the care. They did most of the, but as the, as, as Medicare came along and Medicare <clears throat> paid for ambulance service, then Medicare, then ambulance services began to develop, usually sometimes associated with small hospitals. And the, the, the military concept of the golden hour, that is when somebody's ill, you want to get them to where they can get tertiary care within an hour. Okay. That's not completely held true anymore, but it was a very important impetus to get this done. The other, another scene, left lower, left, right lower hand corner, you'll see the air ambulance, the angel flight. Uh, very important to rural, rural remote places in the state to get them to critical care hospitals. Another thing I'm not gonna talk much about tonight, but, but a, a, very, a very important element of things, okay? Um, next slide, please. Doctors tend to be an independent lot, okay? I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, most practiced <clears throat> one or two man groups and often the one or two man groups were father and son, sometimes father and daughter. These days, sometimes father and daughter, but they were father. And because oftentimes the country doctor viewed the other physicians in town as competition, okay? With the new technologies, with the new laboratory technologies, the CT scanning, and the other things we're going to talk about in a few minutes, these doctors slowly but surely, and economic more as much as anything else, it became it became increasingly difficult to set up an office and do all the things that needed to be done. So doctors started going into groups, and then those groups, and then that with the the reduction in the number of people and number of physicians in rural health community and rural communities. Uh, you began to see organizations like Arcare out of Augusta and the East Arkansas Family Health out of West Memphis. These are organizations that go together, they combine the resources to, pr to provide health care for the people in those areas, the underserved areas. I have a lot of admiration for the people at Arcare. And Baptist Hospital has done a good work job too. Baptist Hospital, SVI in, SVI in, in Hot Springs, uh, the, the hospitals in uh, both uh, Fort Smith and in in uh, Fayetteville and the hospitals in Jonesboro. Okay, next slide, please. In the in the nineteen in the nineteen fifties, there began an avalanche of drugs, and I'm not going to bore you with the list of names. But what I am going to do is just go through just the categories antibiotics from the 1930s forward, oral diabetic agents that changed the lives of the doctor and their patients, birth control pills in the 1960s, ulcer medicines, and then uh, ulcer medicines like Tegamet and proton pump inhibitors. By the way, vagotomy vagal, vagal, and pyloroplasty changed the face of peptic ulcer disease in the 1940s. 
This was surgery that could be done. When you hear people talk about having, having stomach surgery for ulcers, that's what they were having. This was in the 1930s, 1940s, I'm sorry. When Tegumet came on board, and, and by, the, by the 1970s, by the 1970s, 1980s, you could not get a slot in a rural hospital on Monday morning because of all the people having ulcer surgery. When Tegumet came on board, those surgeries went away. We had a young surgeon come to Benton when I was in practice there in, in the early 2000s who had never seen a vagal, vagotomy and pyloric plastic, much less ever done one. Any hypertensive drugs, any hypertensive drugs like calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, these didn't exist in the 1960s. And even if you could identify what people's blood pressure were, you weren't very good at treating the blood pressure because nobody wanted to take the medicines. They made them sick and they made them feel bad, okay? Cortisone uh, came along in the 1950s and it was thought to be a miracle drug. It was going to solve inflammatory arthritis. Well, as you well know, it didn't because it was really was a two-edged sword. And they quickly learned that. Insights come, came along in the 1970s. But needless to say, these changes in technology changed the lives of the patients and the doctors who lived in the small towns. Okay, next slide, please. Now the next piece of technology that just increased everybody's cost and made us a lot better, made us look better anyway, whether it made us any better or not. Uh, uh, computers, computers started making their started making their real impact on non-tertiary care hospitals in the 70s, late 70s and 80s. And PCs started showing up on everybody's desk. And then CT scans. I can remember the very first CC, CT scan that I ordered. And this is my one little story about myself as a country doctor. I lived in Smackover, Arkansas. And a young kid was playing shortstop on our baseball team. And he was hit with a baseball right on the right eye. And he, they called me to go see him. I went to see him. He was throwing up. I said, something really bad going on with this. And Little Rock had just gotten his first CT scanner. And so we put this kid in an ambulance and sent him up there. And sure enough, he had a big old clot behind his head, behind his eye. But this was miraculous. Before this, before this, a brain scan, which was dreadful. They, they didn't show anything. Uh, <laughs> they were not helpful at all. Uh, but the CT scanner was a, an amazing piece of technology that changed our lives. And very soon, all the small hospitals started getting CT scanners. Ultrasound. Ultrasonography is another one of those non-invasive technologies. Not only was it good in strokes, it was good in OB. It's been good in uh, gallbladders. It's good in a number of situations where you can get a definitive answer. MRI scanning just, just carried CT scanning a notch above and a notch above. And uh, again, this is an expensive technology that has kind of slowly made its way. They have portable units that they can put out there. They slowly making its way in the computer. Lithotripsy is another one of those. It's an expensive technology but it can be go to the smaller communities as well. And they do, and they do. Next slide, please. Uh, I, ask a, uh, I asked Dr. John Smith up in uh, Paris, sorry, in Ozark, Arkansas one day, uh, I was interviewing him for our book. And I said, what's the one piece of technology that changed your life the very most? And he said, the telephone, the cell phone. He said, it changed everything about my life. He said, I could go down to the river and go fishing and not even, not even go out in a boat, just sit on the bank. And I didn't have to run back to the office every 10 minutes to give an order for an aspirin. Uh, but the telephone has been around for a long time. 1940s, started getting car phones. And I, I, can, rem I can vaguely remember that. And then in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, we started having bag phones and everyone thought that was just absolutely miraculous. And so now we have the cell phone, which is not just an instrument to, um, some of you are listening to this on, cell, on a cell phone, not just an instrument to talk. It has all kinds of uses, especially in telemedicine. Uh, did you realize that 
their estimates are that there are more people in the world now with a cell phone than who have portable a potable water. There are more people in the world with a cell phone than have clean water. That's amazing to me. Next slide, please. There are, and you can't write history about this because it's, it's happening right now. Uh, EMRs, or electronic medical records. When I started practicing medicine, the first practice I was in, our, elect our, our uh, medical records were on a four by six card and it said, Mr. John Smith dropped down in dent one, John Smith's wife dropped down in dent two, John Smith's children, okay? And that was the full account of the medical record. The medical record for most, for most purposes was not a medical record. It was an accounting record as much as anything else. Uh, <clears throat> that was replaced very quickly by the problem-oriented method or SOAP, uh, Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. Now, this resulted in charts that even in a simple and complicated case, after about 10 years, were about three inches thick, and you couldn't decipher those charts. EMRs, or electronic medical records, came along in the, in the 70s and 80s. The, uh, the Mormons were the first to start working on these, and then they started making it into the general population, and then out into uh, more rural areas and in smaller doctor's offices as, as, as early as, as 2000 and they have made a big difference. There are some problems associated with them and they get in the way sometimes, they get in the way of patient care sometimes, but they are, they, they are a far sight better than the old way of doing things. Uh, today, probably the most interesting technology that is going on that's having an impact on day-to-day -day care, so that when you have a problem, your doctor, whether you live in uh, whether you live in Hackett, Arkansas, or in downtown New York City, can help you, is telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine had its beginnings in the beginning of the 20th century with the advent of radio, and people in remote areas would try to do telemedicine over the radios. Uh, but it didn't really take off. It really didn't take off until the, the 1980s, 1990s. And it was much the same technology, the same kind of technology that created uh, flexible, uh, flexible colonoscopies and the like, but fiber optics. When T1 lines began to be developed, and I don't understand the technology of that, but when T1 lines began to develop in Arkansas, there were two, two groups of people who began to uh, look carefully at this and try to work them. Interestingly, both in psychiatry. One was the US, UAMS uh, psychiatry department who began to do patient evaluations via telemedicine uh, in small towns with community mental health centers and the like. Birch Tree Community, which is a, a fairly large program here in Arkansas that takes care of the seriously mentally ill, began to do again with T1 lines, began to do remote aggressive programs for patient intervention and patient and, and med medical management. Uh, as early as 2000, Dr. Charles made uh, Lowry, and if he hadn't, Lowry, and if he hasn't got any awards, he really should get some awards. He created the Angels Program. It's a, in Arkansas, and I haven't even mentioned uh, high-risk newborns and, and, uh, and, and the like, but he created a program, he's an obstetrician, he created a program to enhance the care of high-risk OB patients in remote parts of the state. Really, really important. Still ongoing, very important. Do a lot of really good work. And then uh, within the last few years, they created a problem called the SAVES program that is for assisting in the care and treatment of acute strokes. How do you get to those people quickly? And, how do, and it's having an impact on rural health. Now, there are a number of things that are going on. I don't know where all this is going. I don't have any idea where it's going. But as you see in this slide in the very lower corner, you can see this physician or somebody looking in this patient's ear with their cell phone with an otoscope attached to it, okay? And this can be seen by their physician remotely, okay? 
in the top corner, you see this young man and his doctor having it having a visit, okay, via telemedicine. In the left lower hand corner, you can see the uh, the blood pressure, the temperature, uh, all kinds of EKG uh, equivalents. You can see all kinds of these kinds of technology that are being fed into telemedicine, so that the so that the rural physician can have the access to everything that anybody else in the world has. Okay, now I don't know where I guess as I said I don't know where this is going, but I think it's very interesting, and I think it will be. I think it will change the face of medicine. Okay, completely in the next 10 years. I think we're gonna see some changes that are gonna be so dramatic. Now, I hear people say this all the time and, and the answer is, I don't know for sure, but, and it that is with fewer and fewer people living in the country and less percentage of our people in the country, will we have country doctors in the future? And the answer is yes. Yes, we will. As long as there are people living in the country there'll be country doctors. They may have different initials behind their name, but they will be country doctors. And there are some really, really good minds like Steve Collier of our care and some of the people at the Baptist system who are working on this system right now. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, um, Sam. We appreciate that. Um, you're all, uh, always interesting presentation. You always give such interesting presentations. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I'm gonna check. Sorry. The, that's okay, that's okay. Um, if anyone has a question, we can take a question or two. Um, um, if anyone has one, just feel free to type it into the chat. I talk too much. <laughs> no, no. I've never known any doctor to talk too much. <laughs> I would I would like to say some, I'd like to say one thing. Okay. okay. Uh I didn't give him much credit, but Dr. Bates uh, is here in the audience tonight. And it you cannot overstate the impact that Dr. Joe Bates, Dr. Tom Bruce, Dr. George Ackerman and Dr. Roger Boast had on country doctors, their patients, and their health. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And I think uh, there are a lot of people uh, on who are, who's, who are listening to you tonight and those who are not here who would agree with you uh, with those sentiments. It doesn't look like we have any um, questions. We had a, a comment, uh, bravo, Sam, interesting, informative. And uh, I think that's probably echoed by other people um, in this group too. I will say before we, we uh, end tonight that these are recorded and uh, after they're edited, we do have a YouTube channel. The Society has a YouTube channel and they will eventually be made, um, be uploaded to that YouTube channel. So it takes a little bit of time to edit them, um, but I will let you know when uh, this video is up. So Sam, thank you again for being here tonight and um, thank you all for being here and I hope you will join us next month, uh, March 4th, um, uh, again for the stay at home lecture series. Thank y'all, y'all have a good night, stay safe. <laughs>